So in this final session entitled Conjunctures of Racism, which David Theo Goldberg and I, um, Vanessa Thompson, will moderate, we will focus on the conjunctural analysis of race, class, and nation in current times of uncertainty and unsettlement. When David and I discussed the themes of this session, the notion of unsettlement came up quickly, also as a heuristic device. In these turbulent times, the notion of unsettlement speaks to the special uncertainty, not just in relation to race, class, and nation, but at their current and genealogical interface. At a time of global unsettlement, in which we see the repetition of earlier structures and atmospheres of authoritarian nationalism and its relation to neoliberal racial capitalism and the restructuring of the global economy, and we also see the global expansion of securitization and punishment of racialized, gendered, poor, and subordinated communities, as well as the geopolitical murderous structures that dispossess millions of people and the retching of the earth, if we use a Fanonian nation to think about climate change, in these times, a rereading and actualization of Balibas and Palestine's race nation class is more urgent than ever. And not only to theorize and critique the current workings of the capitalist world system and its socio-political formations, but also to unsettle the racial, social, gendered contract, as was pointed out yesterday, and to strengthen and further develop modes of resistances. How are racisms produced and reproduced in global capitalism today? How do we re-theorize the relation between already existing uncertainties between race, class, and nation? How do they draw on gender as constitutive for racial capitalism, racial liberalism, and so-called post-racisms? How do race, class, and nation impact reproductive and productive relations of global capital? And what are the current conjunctions of racism in view of the changes of the nation-state system on the one hand? And what would a reading, a rereading of emerging fascisms look like through the, ra through the lens of race, nation, class on the other? Now, these are questions we would like to address in the course of this final session by also picking up strands and lines of thought that were important um, or could not be discussed enough in the last two um, days, and we will func uh, focus on this conjunctural analysis through the notion of unsettlement. While departing from a discussion on the current conjunctures of racism with regard to class, relation, and increased nationalisms, we also want to move toward counter-strategies and modes of resistance in these times of global unsettlement. And in order to engage in such a conjunctural discussion, we have uh, tried to make this, uh, this, this panel um, also um, conjunctural in its performance, meaning we have mixed the participants from the conceptually driven platforms, race, class, and nation, according to their expertise, of course, also. And we have mixed them into three slots and have chosen themes um, for each slot. And they will be introduced via image prompts. Now, the first slot is entitled Uncertainties and Unsettlements, Migration, Religion, and Free Speech. Um, and I'm very delighted to welcome uh, Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar, Baidik Bhattacharya, um, Sharam Kosravi, and Sandro Mesadra to the discussion. And now we're going to look at the images prompts first and then um, kick off the discussion. <laughs> 
welcome to a warm and windy Saturday morning. Um, so I just want to add uh, a, a question um, uh, to this particular uh, session um, that we have at the table now, and it's about uh, the concern around what Philomena Esser has called entitlement racism. So entitlement racism has to do with the way the racially privileged, which is also to say the class and nationally self-anointed, are licensed or have really come to license themselves to say whatever they want to humiliate and degrade those they take not to belong, either fully or at all. So is there a way in which we can speak to how this is playing out in, re in relation both to migrations and to struggles against renewals, you might say struggles against the returns of and on securitization, austerity, and refusal. So the set of conditions that are driving the sort of claim to uh, freedom of expression and, and free speech. Um, could we show the, the last video that uh, we added this morning, uh, the one from the internet? Thanks. depraved mentality? I have no answers for it. I have no answers for it. Just to add one, one more thing here. Um, we were talking at breakfast this morning and Ruth Wilson Gilmore um, told a story, the upshot of which was um, the claim that uh, you have your facts, we have our feelings, or you might say, you have your facts, we have our feelings, or our alternative uh, facts, or our 
in fact, alternative realities. And so that is to be added in the mix around free speech, not least in, re in relation to the question of mi migrations and refugees. So the panel is open for people to speak to it and we'll open it up to the audience in due course. So, Badik, do you want to okay. speak to me? If I could briefly take you back to the last video that you saw. This is actually from uh, contemporary India. The video was produced by the students of Jawaharlal Nehru University from New Delhi. Uh, as many of you probably know, we have an extreme right-wing government in power right now. And the way we think about racism, what we often do not realize, the way it's reproduced structurally through other means as well. Here, there is no direct uh, reference to racism, but they're actually referring back to an Orientalist idea of Hindu past. And they're trying to impose uh, 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 that Hindu idea of India on everyone else, particularly on minorities. The major resistance to this kind of racist idea of uh, Hindu supremacy, if you can think about something like that, is coming from university students. And they're being targeted, as you saw in that video, they're uh, being brutally attacked by the state. Now they are producing various forms of resistance. What I wanted to highlight is the language they are using. The word they are using again and again is azadi, which means freedom. But it's borrowed from a very different context. It's borrowed from the struggle which is happening in Kashmir. As you probably know, many of you, it's mm. partly occupied by Pakistan, partly occupied by India. And the Kashmiris are asking for azadi or freedom for a very long time. The students are appropriating that language and they're suggesting, th there were several uh, signs which actually suggested certain things. They're suggesting that we want uh, azadi or freedom from capitalism, from, from uh, what they call manubad, which is a Hindu supremacist kind of idea. We want azadi from uh, patriarchy and so on and so forth. So I, I was also thinking about different forms in which racism gets reproduced without being explicitly racist, if you can think of something like that. There's no direct racial distinction here. What they're trying to do is they're trying to reformulate racism through religion, primarily. And they're persecuting religious minorities, particularly Muslims and Christians, in the last almost four years now. So that can be one idea to think about. We have um, two minutes. Um, uh, borders, freedom of um, expression, um, Azadi, Azadi Persian word for freedom. Yes. You also could see this Azadi uh, in refugee camps, in, in through the Balkans, in the Greek, when, when asylum seekers, migrants, write on walls. So they link, and also and uh, fitah uh, al, 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 al in Arabic for openness, which people in Damascus has been uh, shouting about. So this is how Kashmir, Delhi, Tehran, Damascus is linked to European cities. Yes. How one protest is linked to another protest, a and how these people we show we, you, you show that that cross borders without papers, they practice. Um, a, 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 a political uh, uh, agenda, they practice as a political movement, they protest, they don't recognize, hundreds, thousands of people don't recognize borders, and this is very, very, for me, is a political manifestation. Um, so this is resistance. This is how one protest is, is linked to another protest. Um, going back to freedom of speech, I also have to say something about that because um, after 30 years in Europe, I, I hear every day complain about us. So I don't know what, why, why there is no freedom of uh, speech. Um, um, and I want to tell you a personal story, which I've, it is not at all personal. It belongs to European history, not to my personal history. 91, I was shot by a racist in Sweden. Uh, I have still fragments of the bullet in my face. Um, and the, I received a letter by the guy from prison. His name is the laser man, like Superman, the laser man. You can uh, Google it. And, and he wrote to me, dear Shahram, 
don't take it personally. Uh, it was, um, what I did was a critique against Swedish migration policy. So this is freedom of speech. You know, he gave himself the freedom to criticize immigration by shooting people. He shoot other people too. Ten people, one died, yeah? So, so this, for me, freedom of speech, you know, all this is about this, yes? It's about how you turn racialized bodies into a battlefield to discuss immigration. Why should we pay the price? Um, yeah, two minutes. Well, I, I, really, I really don't know what to say, but I, I, hearing you, I was thinking about Mexico. And, and the point I want to, to stand is how, um, I mean, Mexicans migrate a lot of Mexicans migrate to the United States, and now we have this Trump affair that uh, he hates Mexicans, and Mexicans mm. are being, going to be sent back and all that. And that, the problem in Mexico is that uh, there is an, it's a moment where a very odd nationalism is being settled, because people that are actually um, gar uh, the guarantee of this reoccupation of territories, of Mexican territories, mm. now wrapped in the flag and said, United States the enemy once again, as has been the problem of Mexican nationalism all the time, mm. that it has, uh, it is too close to United States that uh, these elites can always say, uh, the bad guys are there, and and we are the defendants. So it's, uh, uh, I think nation, it's a problem, <laughs> as I was pointing yesterday. Um, and I don't know how we are going to deal with it, but I think it's an urgent thing to do it. There's, of course, a... Uh, uh, um, uh, the United States, not least the current administration, have given Mexicans lots of grounds on which to constitute the United States as its enemy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. almost goes without saying at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, go back to Azadi, mm -hmm. freedom, mm -hmm. and to kind of conjure up uh, uh, the way in which uh, freedom uh, is chanted uh, in uh, demonstrations of uh, migrants and refugees in many parts of the world, but now I'm thinking in particular uh, of uh, Europe. Freedom is chanted uh, in uh, many different languages. It is uh, usual, uh, the main catchword in uh, demonstrations of uh, refugees and migrants. Beyond the languages, uh, the way, the tone, the kind of passion uh, that uh, is inscribed onto the chant uh, is really striking. Uh, kind of uh, uh, resignification of uh, such an important uh, concept as uh, uh, freedom. Now let's go back to the first uh, three images uh, that uh, we saw, uh, a map of camps uh, in uh, Europe, uh, shipwreck, uh, barbed wire. Uh, a really effective instantiation of the kind uh, of uh, uh, devices uh, uh, against which this search for freedom uh, uh, clashes every day. And this is a really kind of uh, powerful image of one of uh, the most urgent uh, political questions we have uh, to uh, think about. Do these images 
barbed wire, camps, shipwrecks, simply speak of a kind of closure, of a kind of attempt to exclude migrants and refugees. This is, for me, a very important question. Mm -hmm. And my tentative answer would be that this is not the case that what is at stake uh, is rather a kind of production of the conditions of inclusion of migrants uh, and even refugees within European societies, uh, labor markets. Uh, and these conditions are getting tougher and tougher and are getting harder and harder. And uh, let me conclude. Uh, going back to the concept that has been uh, uh, mentioned by David uh, in his uh, introduction, entitlement racism. This is racism uh, that uh, traces a boundary uh, within, uh, uh, let's say, uh, European societies. Uh, uh, but uh, since yesterday we discussed uh, the issue of class uh, also, within what is nowadays the reality of the working class living labor in Europe, in any European country. Entitled racism reminds me of the wages of whiteness, the great image forged by W.B. Du Bois in the 1930s. And the wages of whiteness refers precisely to an internal boundary and uh, to reflect upon the articulation between uh, external borders, the images that we saw, and these uh, more elusive, but also very hard, potentially deadly boundaries in the interior of uh, European societies is another important task for us today. Mm. So, I mean, in a sense, we have two as you put it, uh, clashing conceptions of, um, of, of, of freedoms, right? One is uh, freedom of self-entitlement, and the other, to put it in a nutshell, is f a kind of freedom as liberation, mm -hmm. right? A, a, a striving to mm -hmm. liberate not just oneself, but those with which one's engaged um, in a set of... Um, uh, uh, resistances against repression and uh, you know. yes. Speaking also of the conjunctures, because we clearly see them um, at work, when especially when we think about um, migration, but also what what was mentioned also before, how how um, how it is spoken through, how racism is spoken through migration, but also how racism is spoken, of course, also um, through religion, and that's something that has already picked up. Um, upon in the book, like what's the, how is religion a marker for process of racialization? Um, so there we see the conjunctures also at work, but we also see them at work in the resistance movements because so many intersections um, come to the forefront here, not only um, in terms of an intersection of identities, but also in terms of an intersection of, of struggles, as Angela Davis says. It's like the, the freedom of movement, the struggle for the freedom of movement, the struggle for housing, the struggle for a decent living, um, etc. So here we see the, the conjunctures also of, um, of contemporary um, struggles. And I think what is also interesting, because that, that, that came up yesterday, is um, the question of how to find commonalities um, in these struggles and, and convergences. I was wondering if you want to um, pick up on that, uh, what was already mentioned briefly um, yesterday, maybe before we open it up to, um, to the audience. I, I want to put a point in the, in the table. Um, I want to put the point of war that has everything to do, I mean, I'm, I, I can't not think about your question in this mm -hmm. very moment mm -hmm. without thinking that we are in a war. I mean, in Mexico, we have an ongoing war. Mm -hmm. And the numbers and the figures say it. Mm 
although we don't think about it like that. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem. Mm -hmm. And well, in Syria there is a war, and in, in, in other places in the world there are actually wars. Wars that have at least three things. They are amorphous. We don't know who the enemy is. Huh? Mm -hmm. In Mexico, the enemies are is something called uh, drug dealers. But, but the enemy is us, mm -hmm. because they're killing us. Mm -hmm. it, it's a war that goes in an in informal democratic period. So the society splits in two. The one that is disposable mm -hmm. and killable. Mm -hmm. Killable, I don't know if the word it is, but... Uh, uh, and the one that is not. So you kind of see two realities all the time. Huh? And the third one, it's that it has um, desaparición, how do you say the word? Disappearance, Disappearance mm -hmm. as its main issue. Uh -huh. 36,000 Mexican or disappeared, have been disappeared official figures mm -hmm. in 12 years, more than the Argentinians in the, in the dictatorship. And, and, and it, we don't know about it. I mean, we don't know what is that. And even though there are struggles on that, and even though we are trying to figure out how to manage that and how to stop that. So perhaps this racism thing, this, uh, it's, it's, it has everything to do with installing splits, boundaries, he said, but splits in society. Mm -hmm. So trying to make links, learning how to uh, listen to each other, um, learning how to talk, uh, putting or constructing um, terms of understanding of what is going on, it's very important in Mexico. And I, I want to put this point in the table. Mm -hmm. And it, with the public. I would like to open it to the audience as we only have um, maybe 15 minutes left bef before we go to the next slot. So um, please feel free to ask your questions and we will collect questions. Um, and then. Kelly, yeah. Kelly. Uh, can you speak? Uh, yeah, have the a mic. microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm very struck, Raquel, by what you just said about the, um, and I think this is this is very much part of our current condition. Um, not only in terms of how we as, as intellectuals define what's going on, but also how we as scholar activists or activist intellectuals figure out what, how to respond um, and what would be the terms of, of, um, of engagement. And I, th I think you define something much more general than the Mexican case. Uh, <coughs> this, the devolution of violence of, of, um, of the problem, not to something that we can define in terms of the 20th century, right? Yeah. The, 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 in terms of you know, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the German aggressors, the, you know, these, all of these, mm -hmm. um, these terms that were used throughout the 20th century to, to define quite easily, I mean, maybe they were not also not as appropriate then, but certainly now they're, they're definitely, no, they no longer hold mm -hmm. as an appropriate way to define what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, what you define in Mexico about the drug, the, 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 the drug dealer being the enemy, describes a much more general condition where we, we no longer have the condition of the world war where there are enemy mm. fronts mm. and the capacity to uh, engage with certain kinds of rules of war and terms mm. of engagement. Yeah. And th this, these yeah. have been pulled out from underneath yeah. us such that the enemy becomes the neighbor, the enemy becomes something even in ourselves. The, the, and I think this is, the, the, there's something about the neoliberal condition that, that allows that inheritance to, mm -hmm. to, to take place at the level of the of, of, of these very micro uh, 
micro details or micro yeah. processes. Um, and so, uh, I mean, there's a lot more to say, but, but, but I, think, I think what you define in Mexico is in fact uh, a, a condition, even in those of us dealing with students who are, I don't know how many of you have students who come to your offices and come to consult much more about mental health problems than about the content of the curricula, right? <laughs> that there's a, levels of depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and trauma. Mm -hmm that okay. our students are feeling at the level of their bodies. Um, so I receive many more doctor's notes than I receive, you know, <laughs> <laughs> drafts of papers. Yeah. So there's something about that devolution mm. and the experience of that anxiety and depression and, and, and trauma and problem yeah. in very small very ways deep. that, that mm. I think we need to talk about more generally. Mm. Yeah, perhaps one can almost speak of proliferating civil wars mm. that uh, are not just um, that, that are wars over clashing conceptions of how to be and live in the world together and, ag and against, right? I mean, a kind of proliferated condition that take different instantiations in different places. I mean, so drug war, it characterizes drug war in Mexico, although there are other things going on as well, and will, will be a different kind of war elsewhere, right? A war against migrants, a war against refugees, or... Um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, Can I? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I think at this very moment we are sitting here and talking about seeing these images about borders and border crossing. Thousands and thousands of people are crossing borders without paper. They are not waiting for our responses or our theories or, you know, they already demonstrate, they already perform the utopian we are talking. They, they, they do this border, they show us a borderless world is possible because they do it. We are talking about that, but they are doing that. Yeah, they don't recognize borders. So I uh, think um, just can learn from them, yeah. But it's a dystopian utopia, right? I mean, it's not a... No, of course. Yeah. This is not utopia as yeah. the perfect yeah. world, but yes. utopian as, uh, in, in terms of a board. I mean, we have always received this question, a borderless world is possible, or this is utopian, this is only dream. Mm -hmm. But this is already it's there for many people. Already. They practice mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. This, this is why I meant mm -hmm. uh, utopia, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, it was cut, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Sultan, next. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share something about what's happening at the University of Chicago around free speech issues, mm -hmm. because the university has been propagating its brand as being an absolute defender of free speech, which has meant an absolute defense of the right of the far right to speak, such that they, the administration is engaged in the curtailment of protest um, on the grounds that protest is a curtailment of free speech, right? And, um, and we're dealing with the consequences of, the mo of this at the moment because Steve Bannon has been invited to speak. And a lot of faculty and students are protesting this. But the thing that I want to raise is it's very important to understand that regardless of the outcome of our protest, Bannon wins. Because either he gets the platform to speak or he gets the platform to say that he has been denied his free speech by left university radicals. And so what is at stake here is not just taking a position, but figuring out how <coughs> we can reframe the discursive terrain that allows for an absolutist interpretation of First Amendment. Yeah. And one of the things that yeah, and, and, and just quickly, one of the things that I realized from a law school colleague was that the First Amendment in the US didn't have this absolutist protection to free speech since the Constitution, but that it emerged in the 1920s as part of labor struggles. And that in the 1930s, the ACLU then had to take a decision as to how to then accommodate Nazi speech in the context of how do you keep how do you use free speech as a way to keep open the possibility of labor organizing? Mm 
but then also have to deal with fascist organizing that was ha that was happening. And so it's a diff you know that that's the structure of the problem. I would like to think mm. through. Thank you, um, Sultan, and then Manuela. Um, yeah, maybe we just collect some, yeah. some questions and we mark. Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure this is fully related to what you just said, and I think what you said was really rich, but there's a lot on the table, and I would like to pick up um, what Shahlam Kosrawi said about the bullet and the freedom to speech, to the ability to actually even shut the bullet as a form of freedom of speech. Um, given that we've been talking about race, nation, class, what we're seeing today is really the power of the state when we think about the nation state form here, I feel we kind of naturalize the state form, the ability to injure through the state, through the rights of the state, and also the ability to actually align oneself with the state project as part of the majority, as part of someone who says, even if you overstep our boundaries or if you come here with a visa, I myself, as a citizen who feels entitled, have the right to do this kind of act. So I'm thinking here, how does actually the idea of nation become really, if we think of nation as something more like society, right? Like in these protests that these people have a common voice, they have a common claim, but yet they get disrupted as the wrong nation. They're not the rightful nation because the state has a different project for the nation. So I'm wondering like, how can we complicate this relationship between state and nation if we can see there is a certain group that can have that right to actually incite hateful speech and still gain all that access to freedom of speech or even act violently and still um, justify this action. While someone else who oversteps these boundaries in order to say I need, I need protection from violence is seen as a rapist, is seen as, an, as a disruptor. So I wonder like who gets kind of positioned how and where and who privileges from this nation state form. Maybe we can think here about the state even further critically, like even in this junction from the nation. That's the plea actually. Manuela. Um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, this panel. Um, I want to say actually two different points. Uh, one is on the, on the question of freedom of speech, which I think uh, plays out quite differently here because it's not so much discussed as a topic of freedom of speech, at least not in Germany. But um, there, I think there's always a double, uh, double method that um, right-wing um, speech applies. And this is the first was to say um, that there is actually a taboo to say things and that's why it is a, an act of resistance to say uh, right-wing and racist um, things. But then there's something that I found really useful to understand this, and this is in relation to uh, what Mark Graham was uh, basically describing yesterday in terms of the um, digital economy and how we have um, talked about this as uh, disruptive, disruptive economies. So economies, I mean, Mark said at some point, um, it is actually not really legal what people are doing and they don't feel that there is any um, and the, the, the workers have no option um, to somehow, um, they, they, have no, they, they don't know where to turn to to ask for their rights, their labor rights. And that is an analogy to, to migration and to migrants in my understanding. But what is much more, what I think is interesting in terms of these right-wing discourses is that we could think of them as disruptive discourses. So what the right is doing, they are seizing land of discursive land in order to basically disrupt a landscape in which there was no right to say these things, but then they make it their right in, in disrupting a certain um, economy of, of speech. And then usually, I mean, what we see here is they say things, then they basically turn back and say, oh, we didn't mean it. 
and we didn't say this, and this is actually not what I have said, etc. But by having, but, but having disrupted this first, you know, with this first disruption, and, um, and uh, that, that is basically the technique in which they seize land and are able to speak, uh, speak out what, they, what wasn't been possible to say before. And this is something that you know, we have seen particularly in Austria happening. And in Austria, this has happened to a degree where now we have a right extremist government. And uh, this may be considered uh, you know, a small country in Europe, but it is a country in which we see almost a coup d'etat happening at the moment by the right. So, you know, speaking of dangerous. The other thing is that um, I would like to go back um, um, to what Shahram and Sandro have, uh, have said, also because there is long commitment in Germany to speak of exactly this, uh, these issues. In the late 90s, um, I had the pleasure to uh, be part of a, a predominantly migrant, anti-racist, national-wide group, and uh, the way we have we have um, organized ourselves was in the first place to understand the heritage or basically find out about the history of, uh, of anti-racist resistance by migrants in Germany. So what we needed was a knowledge and what we needed was a history in order to build up on what we then had to understand in the new conjuncture that we found ourselves in at the, in, in the 90s. And one way to think about these things was actually to think about migrant subjectivity, and we gave this a name, and we, talk, we talked about the autonomy of migration. And that was in the late 90s. Okay, so just to, to make it short, and I stopped then, uh, is that up, as much as, and because, you know, there is a, a commitment to this, um, to this idea of migrant subjectivity, so this is where I speak from, we also then tried to think about it strategically. What does it mean to then organize a politics on the ground that somehow puts this utopia into a concrete setting, and this is migrants' existence, presence, and lives in Germany. What does that mean? So, of course, one of the things that we came up with was the language of rights, yeah? the entitlement of rights to people that have no rights. And to say that there is a gradual connection between those who are undocumented to those who are migrants of the second and third generation. And the idea was to speak, uh, in this sense, of the legalization of, uh, um, of people that would not only affect those undocumented, but also those who were there in the second and third generation. One last sentence. I don't know if it worked. I think we, yeah. yeah, so maybe we um, just shift over if there are responses here or. Any um, last comments? Yeah. Would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also important to recognize that with reference to racism, this freedom of speech, what happens to the freedom of speech when it becomes a minority voice, right? It's not a popular one. Not necessarily everybody supporting the popular one are racist, but it's not a popular one. How do you articulate that anxiety? How do you articulate that kind of argument? For instance, I can give you just one uh, last sentence, one uh, example from, again, from India. Our current government is imposing a system where all of us, 1.3 billion people, should have one unique identification number and a card. Everything else in our life should be related to that. Apparently, it's a way of weeding out corruption. As a result of this, this project has widespread support. It's a popular project. Not necessarily everybody who is supporting that project would vote for this government, but they are anti-corruption, let's say. But there is also a real fear that this is actually a mechanism for persecuting minorities. We have instances in the past, during religious riots, these Hindu right-wing groups, they used to go out with voter lists, 
right? Which will give you the names and addresses of your Muslim neighbors. Very soon, they will probably use this database, which will give all the details of your Muslim neighbors. So how do you protest or how do you, you know, say something against it, which is a popular project, not necessarily you know, supported by virulent races, but at the same time you see the danger and how do you, what happens to your freedom of speech in a situation like this? That is something probably we can also think about. Uh, I was also part uh, of uh, the kind of uh, discussions <coughs> that uh, Manuela was uh, mentioning, uh, referring back to the 1990s, and uh, I continue to be convinced that uh, it is crucially important to emphasize, uh, let's say, the subjective dimensions of uh, movements uh, of uh, migration. And this is what Sharam was doing in a very effective way before when uh, he was uh, uh, pointing to the fact that uh, any act of border crossing without authorization is a political act. Of course, it raises the question of uh, what the political is, uh, but it is a political uh, act insofar as uh, uh, it uh, stages this moment of clash between uh, uh, search for freedom and uh, uh, bordering devices that uh, I was uh, mentioning before. Does it have to do with uh, a utopia? Well, I don't think uh, utopia is the best word uh, mm. to uh, characterize uh, the political nature of uh, that uh, act. Uh, maybe it is more productive to think uh, of those acts uh, in terms uh, of the concept of abolition as uh, it is uh, uh, used uh, uh, in African-American uh, uh, theory and uh, uh, politics. <laughs> if we use the notion of abolition in uh, this case, then it is uh, maybe easier to connect the political nature of the act of border crossing, of crossing an international border, with the everyday uh, struggles against the internal boundaries that uh, I was mentioning before, and this is crucially important for me. And if we connect uh, the uh, act of border crossing with the daily struggles against uh, internal boundaries, then we have uh, maybe a, a kind of productive angle on the intersection of struggles that uh, was mentioned before, and uh, even on uh, the possibility, the uh, uh, actual possibility of building a solidarity that uh, is not predicated upon a kind of uh, easy image of what solidarity is. <laughs> a solidarity that is predicated upon uh, multiple struggles against the multiple boundaries uh, that uh, divide us. Thank you. Um, I think this is a really good transition to um, the second slot. I know there is much more to say, and that's why I'm pre uh, yeah, I, I really, um, uh, it would be great if you can keep your questions, or we can also trace them in to the next slot. And you, of course, also um, invited to further engage and participate, but I think due to time, but also due to um, what you, uh, what you just mentioned, I think this is a great part to transition because especially abolition democracy, practices of abolition democracy are also very much based in feminist intersectional politics. So I would like to switch the slot um, to dangerous conjunctions and reproductive relations. Can I say, uh, one sentence. One sentence. Yeah. One sentence. Yeah. Um, not a Hegel sentence. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I, I, I am thinking and I remembering. Mm. What the uh, Italian feminist said in the 70s, mm. don't you think you have rights? Thank you, that's why I... And yeah. I think we all should think mm. that, mm. because that's true. Mm. Okay. Thanks.